Folks, thanks a lot for the 60,000 subscribers, you guys are awesome. But we're not stopping here, let's push it folks to 100,000 subscribers, so give that support to the channel and subscribe, and hit that like button down below to reach our goal of 150 likes, and now let's go for it. Everything starts with the tale of a hero who, like others, destroys everything that causes suffering and seeks to heal the pain of those who need to be saved. However, every hero awaits a premature end, whether through the betrayal of someone he trusted or by falling into an enemy's trap. Once, one of these heroes was so powerful that people avoided him out of fear that he continued to save those in need at the cost of his own heart. When the world was saved on the brink of death, he prayed to the gods to grant a wish in his next reincarnation. Next, a boy named Alan wakes up with his brother screaming his name because their father is calling. This brother despises Alan for being lazy and undeserving of the comfort he has, wishing their father would be stricter with the older brother's behavior. But he believes today is the day everything will change. So Alan arrives in the throne room where his father mentions that the boy was born into the Westfelt Ducal family 15 years ago, yet he never advanced past level 1. And worst of all, at the blessing ceremony held the previous day, Alan received no gift, even though every child in this world receives a gift from the gods. For this reason, Alan's father sees him as a failure who embarrasses the family name, being the heir of the Westfelt family, so he kicks his son out of the house. Outside the gates, Alan celebrates being free from such an unbearable duke after being reincarnated. Now he could follow his own path and seek the inner peace he so desired in his past life. For this, the boy wanders to the borderlands in the east of Westfeld, where he hopes for a peaceful life far from trouble, unlike his previous incarnation where people feared him. On his way to his destination, he finds a good place to rest before continuing his journey but spots in the distance a knight named Beatrice, who is facing alone some stone dogs. She tears the beasts apart, but they quickly regenerate, leaving her companion, Lise, in danger. Beatrice asks her friend to flee, but Lise doesn't want to leave and abandon the knight alone with these beasts. Watching the scene, Alan recognizes the first princess of the kingdom of Adostella, Lise Adostella, and wonders what princess would be doing in a place like that. Then we're taken to a memory where Lise overhears the guests at a ceremony mocking Alan, the heir of the ducal house of Adostella, calling him a coward and that Craig is surely devastated for having lost his wife and being left with his failed son. Lice rages against the men, saying Alan is a very decent boy. Faced with this memory, the boy thinks he could prevent harm from happening to the girl who defended him so much. At that moment, Beatrice takes a hard blow and falls to the ground, leaving the princess defenseless. So Alan rushes at great speed toward the danger, where Lice had already accepted death and finds it strange that all she can think of at that moment is Alan. Because of this, she calls out the boy's name before being attacked by the dogs, and at the same moment, the boy had saved the princess in time, asking her if someone happened to call his name. Liza wants to know how Alan ended up there at that moment, but the boy is busy dealing with the other beasts that are still a threat. So he charges against them and uses his divine eyes, identifying the cores that are the weak points of his enemies. Focusing on this, Alan invokes the end of the world and blossoming of a hundred flowers ability to launch several swords at the targets. With that, the threat had been defeated, but Beatrice was still in danger of losing her life. Alan recognizes Beatrice from ancient times and promises to heal her wounds and uses a technique from the Parallel Paradox to completely erase the warrior's wounds, even restoring her armor. Faced with so much power, Lise asks how her friend reached this level, and he tries to hide the fact that he inherited it from a past life, while Beatrice supposes it's a gift from a level that the church itself is unaware of. As the princess buys into this idea, the boy confirms that's the case, getting rid of that for now. Next, he asks why the princess is in a place like this, and she tells him she received a divine revelation a few days ago. It wasn't any precise information, but the princess's gift said she could prevent ill omen if she paid attention to the words spoken. Through this revelation, the two were guided to Clune Village on the border, but they were attacked on the way. According to Beatrice, if it weren't for Alan, the two might have been killed. Then the princess returns the question and also wants to know what Alan is doing there, but the boy prefers to talk in a carriage right behind them. Lice comments that it's broken, but Alan rebuilds the carriage using another healing light magic from the Parallel Paradox. Soon, with Beatrice on the horse's reins, Alan says he was expelled from the Westfelt family and also intends to go to the borders of that domain. He asks if the princess allows it, since a servant with his skills would be very useful for training. Beatrice comments that obviously he would need to be returned, considering the crown's interests, but Princess Lise decides to put her friend ahead of the kingdom, although it makes her unsuitable for royalty. As night falls, the three arrive at a village where everything is too empty and quiet and Alan doesn't even feel the presence of monsters nearby. Beatrice points out that the team wasn't attacked after Alan joined and the boy thinks it's because perhaps the monsters are afraid of something and are avoiding the village. 
However, a little further ahead, they find the villagers gathered in front of a structure from which a girl was expelled by a man. Lys recognizes this girl as the light sent to her as a sign, and her name is Akira. On the other hand, Akira has no idea who the girl speaking to her is, so the princess introduces herself offended for not being recognized, since she showed the entire palace to the girl and even had lunch with her. Alan wants to know what this light talk is about, so Beatrice explains that it comes from a gift called Valiant, so rare that it's only given to one person in each generation, granting the power of a thousand warriors to the bearer. In this current generation, the heroine who carries the strongest gift is Akira Kazuragi, and the revelation that Lies received was, become a guide to the light and eliminate the darkness. Soon, the group gathers to quell their hunger and Akira reveals she was wandering aimlessly until she stumbled upon this village where a child told her she had nearly been sacrificed to the dragon residing in the mountains nearby. Thus, Akira sought details from the village chief, but he warned her not to interfere. Confronted with this, Alan speculates they allow the dragon to stay for protection, as in a small village like this, monster attacks are a matter of life or death, which would explain the abnormal absence of monsters in the region. Akira agrees with the boy's assumption and soon reveals she instructed the girl who was offered as a sacrifice to hide in a cave nearby until everything was resolved. However, now that she's had her fill and there's nothing interesting in this place, Akira decides to slay the dragon once and for all and calls on those who wish to accompany her. Alan considers the possibility that the villagers may not want to rid themselves of the dragon and that killing it could cause a conflict, but Akira promised to help the child and that's what she's going to do. After the heroine departs, Lees and Beatrice decide to join her, and eventually, Alan follows suit because he doesn't want to enjoy peace and tranquility on the frontier while his friends are in danger. Just in front of the mountain where the dragon resides, Akira gathers the group to devise a strategy. She will approach the peak via the main road, while the rest will circle around from behind to surround the creature. Alan questions whether it wouldn't be better for him to go in front instead of Akira, but the heroine refuses his request, sensing that the boy is the type to handle things on his own. Alan downplays it, saying he's being overestimated, but Akira insists that the boy is no ordinary person, leaving everyone looking at him with a question mark. Finally, Akira reveals that she intends to throw down with the boy, but only after defeating a dragon. Then she sets off ahead at following her strategy and urges the rest of the people to hurry, or else she'll take down the beast alone. With everyone aware of their roles, the trio scales the mountain slopes, and Alan worries about the princess, but she assures him she knows a thing or two about self-defense. Meanwhile, Beatrice finds it curious that the Westfelts, who pride themselves on their military might, haven't discovered a dragon within their borders. In turn, Alan believes that his old family and this dragon have some kind of connection and therefore there has been no conflict between them. He goes further, suggesting that perhaps the village of Clume was built precisely for the purpose of offering sacrifices. With this, Beatrice agrees that maintaining an agreement with the dragon would keep the border secure, but Alan believes that is only a consequence of this relationship and that the real purpose is much worse than that. At this moment, the dragon senses Akira's presence and attacks the heroine, who retaliates by invoking the Sovereign of Lightning. She believes this will do the trick, but the dragon emerges unscathed, mocking the human and questioning if this is some kind of joke. In response to the creature's arrogance, Akira decides not to go easy in this fight. But the dragon points out that innocent people may become victims of this crossfire, turning its head toward the small girl who was offered as a sacrifice. Akira asks how the dragon found this child, and it responds that it let her escape on purpose because its intention was never to devour humans but to enjoy seeing the despair on their faces because a dragon's life is too long not to kill time with such interesting activities. Therefore, it released the offering just to see what would happen next. Faced with this insolence, Akira fills with hatred and attacks the dragon with a final blow of celestial blue lightning destruction. Convinced she has defeated the enemy, she turns around only to see the monster unharmed and further mocking the heroine's weakness. Then it strikes the girl forcefully, claiming it's ridiculous for someone so useless to call themselves a hero. Immobilized, Akira realizes there is an abyss of power between them, while the dragon fills its mouth with fire. However, as it was about to unleash the final blow, Alan appears and tears off one of its wings. Alan stands in front of Akira to protect her and taunts the dragon, mentioning the arrogance it has shown so far, so the creature angrily advances towards the humans. Alan asks Elise to take care of the heroine and for Beatrice to take the child, then he invokes an ability called Demon Assassin's Sword, causing enormous damage to the enemy. The creature wonders how it can be injured by a mere human with a blunt blade since it is the Red Dragon King, the living being closest to a god. Alan acknowledges that this monster is on a different level, but watching the battle between him and Akira, he believes he can win with his technique of the end of the world. 
However, the dragon plays dirty and uses the rest of the group as helpless shields. However, Lise motivates Alan to do what must be done. And in that moment, he remembers that he lost the ability to face people since he began to be called a failure. Still, he sees that Lise awakens a strange courage within him. So he charges at the dragon, who decides to end everyone at once. But the mysterious warrior uses the light, the supreme ability of the end of the world. And as the intense glow of the weapon pierces the creature's armor, the darkness of the sky dissipates along with the red dragon king and its scales fall from the sky like a pedal shower. Shortly after, Akira awakens and embraces the child she promised to save. While Alan reflects that saving a princess and helping a hero kill a dragon wasn't the kind of peaceful life he wanted. But when Lise extends her hand to the boy, he realizes that a small detour on the path isn't harmful. The next day, Alan wakes up startled and apologizes for having slept for too long, but Lise reassures the boy, after all, the battle against the Red Dragon King must have been very exhausting. So Alan asks where the others are, and the princess points to the middle of the field, where Akira and Beatrice are facing off in a training duel. Then Lise takes the opportunity to explain her ability to heal people that she demonstrated earlier. However, Alan mentions hearing stories about a miraculous saint who heals any illness or injury at the doorsteps of homes in need, expressing surprise that it's the princess. Nevertheless to him, whether she's a princess or a miraculous saint, Lise remains just herself. With that said, an atmosphere of affection grows between the two, but Akira shouts for Alan to train with them, disrupting the intimate moment. Some time later, the adventurers bid farewell to Akira and the little rescued girl. They invited heroine to join their journey, but she doesn't get along well with carriages, preferring to walk instead. Lise asks if Akira is sure she wants to stay with the child, and she responds that the two have already bonded and besides, her family no longer exists, so returning her to the same village isn't a good idea. The little girl rejoices at this opportunity to start a new life, while Akira apologizes to Alan for the broken sword, feeling that she should have been the one to kill that dragon instead of leaving everything to the boy. Therefore, Akira feels inadequate and intends to hand over the sacred sword to someone worthy of it, which in this case is Alan. Humbly, Alan responds that he was only able to win with Akira's help, and that to the little girl by her side, Akira is the only hero that matters around there. Thus, the two bid farewell and go their separate ways without the rest of the team. In the late afternoon at the West Fault family palace, Alan's father informs a mysterious man in a suit that the Red Dragon King was defeated when trying to lure the heroine into an ambush. The man in the suit assumes that she had the help of the saint, so the Duke realizes that there's more to it. Alan's younger brother rages over the dragon's death, lamenting that the clay dogs weren't able to eliminate the princess, promising to send a whole pack next time to avoid the risk of failure again. However, the Duke reminds them that the dragon's death caused a limitation of material, so they can't waste magical life forms. The boy thinks this thriftiness will let the princess escape, but the Duke assures that as long as the targets are within Westfelt lands, opportunities to catch her won't be lacking. However, more importantly, the Duke wants to know if that elf has been found, and the unknown man responds that there's no need to hurry because soon he'll deliver the elf's head to the noble. With the departure of the man in the suit, the Duke rejoices at the opportunity to bury these annoying god's puppets and avenge the Westfelt family. Meanwhile, in the carriage, Alan asks about a friend of Lee's who is a blacksmith, and she explains that this blacksmith lives in a city not far from there called Granholm. Lise would love to ask her friend to make a new sword for Alan. He in turn is surprised to hear about cities on the border while Beatrice asserts that their friend is a good professional despite there not being many elven blacksmiths. Then Lise apologizes to Alan for her revelation putting him in this whole situation and intends to give the sword as a reward. Alan accepts the gift but asks if the princess shouldn't return to the capital. She explains that she has already informed her father besides being with Beatrice. As night falls, the group sets up a camp to sleep and Beatrice offers to light a fire, but Alan uses his power to create fire for everyone, leaving the warrior stunned. Lice is exhausted and ends up falling asleep on her friend's shoulder and Beatrice teases, saying they're engaged, so there's no problem with that, but Lise makes it clear they're no longer engaged and she doesn't want to sleep on the boy's lap. Despite her speech, she ends up sleeping on Alan's shoulder who realizes that this is the first moment of tranquility since he arrived in this world and remembers that it was also a beautiful moonlit night the first time he met Lise. On that day, she found Alan on a balcony and introduced herself to him, starting a conversation about the beauty of the night. Furthermore, she reveals that she's counting on the boy from now on after all they're engaged and Alan is confused by this news. The next morning, they arrive in Granholm, a place so lively that it didn't seem like a border town, according to Alan. Beatrice explains that travelers and wanderers often pass through this type of city precisely because it's on the border. Soon, they all arrive at the blacksmith's house, but it seems that the elf isn't home. 
Alan notices that the door is unlocked, so the girls enter and call out for their friend Noel, while Alan admires the perfection of the craftsmanship of those weapons inside. At that moment, Lee screams upon seeing Noel unconscious on the floor, but Beatrice assures that it's just the elf's usual heavy sleep. With that, the saint heals her friend, and the bodyguard explains that Noel doesn't eat, drink, or sleep when she starts making a weapon, and therefore passes out from exhaustion. The princess has already asked her to take it easy with work, but she never listens. At that moment, the blacksmith wakes up and sees her friends whom she hadn't seen in so long but wants to know who the guy next to them is. So he's introduced as Alan, one of Lisa's guards who asks the elf to forge a sword for him. However, Noel has too many orders lined up so she doesn't have time for that. Lys is frustrated and Beatrice understands the blacksmith's side, who grumbles that this man already has a sword. Alan shows that the weapon is broken and the elf feels ashamed for someone so clumsy wanting to wield a weapon made by her. However, upon picking up the sword, she notices that it was used to its limit to break like that, which intrigues the blacksmith to the point of her changing her mind and agreeing to make another blade for the warrior. She asks if Alan wants a sword that surpasses the sacred sword, simply the most powerful weapon she could produce after all, only a few people are capable of wielding such equipment and Noel believes Alan is one of those people. With that said, the boy has no reason to refuse, so Ferreira prepares to start the work by pushing all the visitors out. Alone inside the house, the elf remembers Vanessa, a blacksmith she greatly admired in her childhood, and immediately promises to produce a weapon that will surpass the sacred sword. As she leaves, Lise hopes that Noel doesn't overdo it with work, and Alan suggests that the group find an inn to stay in while waiting for the sword to be ready. Nearby, a woman reveals herself and intends to report what she's seeing. Soon, she tells the man in the suit that the saint was seen with her bodyguard and another warrior, and the man is surprised because he thought the princess would only be accompanied by Beatrice, so he plans to investigate the matter. Meanwhile, at a nearby inn, Alan asks what they're going to do during these days and Beatrice recommends that he do what he's always wanted, relax, and not worry. However, Lee suggests he visit the Adventurer's Guild to sell the items the dragon dropped, and Alan thinks it's a good idea to cover the hotel expenses. With that decided, the girls decide to take a stroll around the city in Alan's absence, with the boy gone, Beatrice questions whether the two of them alone will really be able to handle this matter, but Lise prefers not to involve Alan in it. Shortly after, the warrior finds the guild and shows the dragon scales he looted, and the receptionist is impressed to have such a rare item on the counter. Unsure of what to do, she takes some and rushes to speak to the manager, leaving Alan empty-handed. At that moment, the man in the suit takes advantage of the situation to approach Alan and ask for details about the dragon scales the boy is carrying. Seeing his lack of manners, the man takes off his hat and introduces himself properly as Horus, along with his friend Mylena, a rare Amazon to be found in these lands. Horus explains that he never tires of hearing adventurers' stories, so he wants to know if Alan obtained these dragon scales alone. In turn, the boy mentions that he had the heroine's help, and Horus becomes intrigued by this conversation but the attendant returns at that moment, claiming to have assessed the value of the scales. Alan looks back at the mysterious man, but he had disappeared along with his companion. Outside, Horace comments to Mylene that he never imagined that the man accompanying the princess is just a useless person without talent, but the Amazon feels something in that young man that bothers her a lot, although Horace thinks he is not a problem. Days later, the trio returns to Noel's blacksmith, hoping the sword is ready, but once again she was passed out on the ground. After being healed, Noel points to the most powerful weapon she could forge, and as Alan wields the blade, he is sure it's a great sword. Noel wants to test the weapon right away, but Liz warns that she won't be healing the elf all the time. Still, the blacksmith chooses to accompany the boy because only by observing the sword will she know if any adjustments are needed. Alan notices the girl's perfectionism and asks why she decided to be a blacksmith. She questions if it's strange for an elf to have this profession, and Alan believes it is because of the characteristics of the race's talent, and that's why dwarves are usually more suited to it. Then, Noelle reveals that she was raised by a dwarf, and doesn't know where she was born or who her parents are, but only remembers being in an unknown place, wandering aimlessly, until she was rescued by Vanessa. Vanessa was persistent, clumsy, and stubborn. She never wanted to teach Noelle how to make a sword, but she was still an important master for the elf. But instead of finishing the story, Noel says it doesn't matter and runs away to avoid exposing herself so personally, so Horace takes advantage of the opportunity to appear once again, commenting that you would love to hear more stories like that when they return to the city. Alan notices that there's something strange about this man and this Amazon, but before the conversation evolves, Noel hurries the boy to continue with the sword test. The elf observes Horace and thinks he's someone she knows, but she soon gives up the idea. 
As they move away, the man in the suit comments to Maitlene that probably that boy didn't pry into their affairs, so he asks the Amazon to keep an eye on Alan so he doesn't uncover the secret. Returning to the warrior, he tests the sacred sword and after defeating some creatures with it, he is satisfied with the blade, so Noel borrows the weapon and reveals her talent, an ability to see conditions invisible to normal eyes in this type of weapon. So analyzing the angle, speed, and impeccable position with which Alan wields the sword, she is sure that her vision of him was correct as being the ideal user of the sacred sword. Still, she finds it interesting to see how the boy fares against a stronger monster, so she calls him to continue on the path ahead. Venturing deeper into the forest, they arrive at a place where Noel swears there have always been many monsters, but since it's empty, she supposes they are afraid of Alan's presence. However, the boy is sure it's not fear of him, but of something else nearby. So he casts a spell that disperses the fog, revealing a huge wolf that terrifies Noel, reminding her that it was this creature that swallowed Vanessa. Faced with this, she stammers in fear until she asks Alan to use the sacred sword and end the wild beast. At this moment, we return to Noel's past, where she tries to get Vanessa's attention, who is deeply focused on her work. The elf insists she's hungry, visibly irritating Vanessa, who then frowns, hoping to deter the young one. However, hours pass and the blacksmith was still hard at work, while Noel had managed to scrounge up something to eat. Approaching Vanessa, the elf asks how she manages to use all these different tools, but Vanessa remains silent. Irritated by being ignored, Noel misbehaves, lifting a huge sword with her hands, but loses balance and falls, knocking over several things on the nearby shelf. Even so, Noel hadn't gained the attention she sought, so she decides to back off and sit near the dwarf again. Noel asks what's so great about hammering on a sword all day, especially when it leads to feeling sick from not eating or drinking anything for days. Seeing she won't get what she wants from a distance, the petit one approaches Vanessa repeatedly calling her dumb for not even knowing how to speak, but even this tactic fails. The next day, Enola sleeps anywhere in the house while the hammering continues incessantly until suddenly, Vanessa interrupts her work. Proud of the sword she has forged, Vanessa lifts it with a smile while Noel watches with curiosity. After that, we return to the present moment where Noel insists that Alan kill the beast, but he says he has no reason to, as the wolf is just sleeping in its corner, away from humans. He asserts he doesn't wish to take on the elf's vengeance, so Noel takes the boy's sword to seek justice herself. However, Alan advises her against it, explaining that the creature Fenrir has a barrier that nullifies any attack below a certain level. This sword, for instance, wouldn't even scratch the monster and he reminds Noel that she knows this, as she has yet to create a weapon stronger than the sacred sword. With that, Alan leaves the decision in the elf's hands. Upon returning to the lodging, the warrior informs the rest of the group about the giant beast in the border region. He believes someone brought that Fenrir to this territory because the animal was concealed by some kind of magic, and Alan has a hunch about the reason. Before that, he asks if Lise and Beatrice reveal their true purpose and the girls realize they can't hide anything from him. So Lise explains that about three months ago, the famous General Searle, one of the kingdom's strongest, was murdered. No one knows why, but the assailant took the general's head with him. Many spells were used to try to uncover the motive, but it's still unknown to this day. Suspicions suggest the culprit is a demon as these beings use magics unknown to humans, but since demons aren't known for killing humans and caring about politics, perhaps he's under someone else's orders. For all these reasons, Lise and Beatrice were investigating this case in this city, and after some thought, Alan believes he has a suspect. Meanwhile, at the border, Mylene wonders who managed to undo the Femur's camouflage as it's not something simple to do. Therefore, she believes she's dealing with a more dangerous enemy than Horace imagines. When she returns to her boss to report her mission, he informs her that he will soon make his move because his time in this city is up, so Mylene must bring the elves and the saints' heads. Seeing the girl seem frightened by the request, Horace questions how a feared Amazon can be so sensitive, and when the magical subordination collar appears on the girl, the man makes it clear he won't accept a no as an answer. Meanwhile, Noel is crafting new weapons and remembers when Alan said that depending on how his sword is refined, maybe one day it can even harm Fenrir. Noel asks the boy to tell her everything he knows about it, and agreeing, Alan asks the elf not to be reckless with what he's about to teach her. Persistent in her goal, Noel is sure that one day she will be able to surpass the sacred sword, but her exhaustion had reached the point of making her fall asleep again. Then a nightmare of the moment when the Fenrir attacked her home occurs, and Noel is trapped under the debris that fell from the ceiling. Vanessa tries to fight the Fenrir, while Horace admits she is a great blacksmith, but that's a problem for him because he doesn't want anyone to be able to produce weapons superior to the sacred swords. At that moment, Vanessa advances against the wolf, 
but a magical shield he possesses shatters her sword, leaving her at the mercy of the creature. After dealing with Vanessa, the Fenrir rushes toward the elf, but Akira appears and casts a lightning bolt at the monster. As the magic has no effect on him, the heroine advances and cuts him with her sword, forcing Horus to retreat along with the beast. With the enemies fleeing, Noah goes to her master's body to mourn her loss. Akira tries to convince her to tend to her wounds, but Noel questions why the heroine had a sword capable of injuring the wolf, but Vanessa didn't. Soon, the young elf embraces the weapon her master took so long to make and cries copiously in front of her body. At dawn, Noel wakes up feeling strangely light and hearing a noise outside. She thinks it's Lee's, but it's Alan, checking if the blacksmith really wasn't overdoing it with work as promised. Then, after a long day's work, the blacksmith finishes another sword and returns with it to the forest where the Fenrir was last seen, apologizing to Alan for using his sword. After a long walk, Noel confronts her arc rival and raises the blade to pierce the beast, but she hears the sound of the sword and is struck by the elf first. After Noel struggles her feet, Horus appears and is impressed that the girl wasn't incapacitated by a Fenrir's swipe. Finally, he reveals that he was looking for the elf Noel Leonhardt. The elf asks if the man will kill her, just like he did with Vanessa, and upon hearing that name, Horus scratches his chin and remembers that this elf indeed seemed familiar because she was the one with the dwarf blacksmith. Because of this, Horus believes that the master and apprentice being killed by Femur is a twist of fate, but Noel tries to prevent it from happening, yet when she charges at the wolf, he leaps over her and hits her back with his hind paw. With that, Horus wishes to ask one last thing before the elf is devoured. He wants to know if she would serve him because such extraordinary talent as hers would be wasted in Fenrir's stomach. This talent is the Grom Vision, the eyes of the Sovereign Fairy. There are only five known innate gifts in this world, and this is one of them. Nonetheless, Horus promises to reward the blacksmith, just as he does to this day with his subordinate Amazon, because after Horus destroyed her homeland, he took the girl away to serve him. Facing this, Noel responds that she would rather die than serve this man, so he regrets the girl's wrong decision and orders the giant wolf to finish her off, but before the final blow, Alan appears and saves his friend's life. Seeing the young man's capability, Horus confesses that he underestimated his talents, but at the same time believes it was foolish of the young man to abandon his main post to get there because if anything happens to the princess, it will be difficult to reach her in time. By the way, Mylene was already inside Lee's and Beatrice's room, however, as she approached Princess Lisa's bed, it was only a tied mattress. In fact, the two were already prepared for this encounter and were waiting hidden for the Amazon's arrival. Returning to Alan, he mocks the enemy's arrogance, for at no moment did he consider Mylene being discovered. Knowing how she operates, the boy placed a barrier that nullifies invisibility around Lee's. Alan has been the target of such plans so many times in his past life that he's more than accustomed to them. Horus finds it amusing that the boy mentioned his supposed past life, and he knows that even with Mylene exposed, it doesn't mean Beatrice can defeat her. In the inn room, the two warriors clash for the princess's life, but when Beatrice was about to go all out against her opponent, Lee's asks her to stop immediately. With this distraction, the Amazon takes advantage and hits her opponent with her elbow, rendering her unconscious. With this, the path was clear for Mylene to finish off the princess. But instead of completing the job, the Amazon hesitated until Beatrice managed to save her friend in time. Watching the fight from afar, Alan sees that the two won't need any help and informs Horus that his execution attempt failed. Still, Horus believes he is in control of the situation, since Fenrir cannot be harmed without a sacred sword. Therefore, he orders the wolf to destroy the insolent boy, and the beast's imposing presence makes Noel recall old visions of her trauma and scream for Alan, but the warrior manages to open a hole in the monster's body without major problems, causing Horus to flee at that moment in the face of such a great force. Soon Alan is carrying Noah back home, taking advantage of the fact that the elf passed out after he healed her. Besides, she had spent the night forging, so sleep was expected. At that moment, Lise comes running towards her friend to see how he is. Fortunately, everyone is fine, but Noel isn't happy when she wakes up and sees that Alan was carrying her without her permission. The next day, they assess that Mylene has been released from Horus's subordination spell, so she should be able to speak freely. Beatrice thinks it's best to take her to an official trial in the capital, but Lise believes that this girl is not evil, so she wants to find a more peaceful way to resolve the situation. The bodyguard reminds that the Amazon tried to kill the princess, but she responds that it wasn't this girl's intention. Anyway, Lise believes that Mylene has someone from her people waiting for her, but the Amazon explains that her homeland was burned, and she has nothing left, no one, nowhere to go. At that moment, Noel remembers when she was rescued by Vanessa and after asking her name, the dwarf blacksmith announces that she will take the elf to her house. Soon, in a moment of empathy, the elf blacksmith cuts the Amazon's bonds and frees her, 
besides inviting the girl to live in her house. Beatrice argues that this woman may attack Lee's at any moment, but Noel believes otherwise, and if that happens, Mylene will get a good scolding. With that, the Amazon is moved by the support she received from this strange person, and starts crying. Beatrice thinks she was too harsh on the girl, but she's only crying tears of joy. Therefore, Alan realizes that today's problem is solved. Then in the middle of the night, he returns alone to the forest and casts a powerful spell. Meanwhile, Horace is far away from the protagonist, certain that he escaped death. Still, he wonders who that kid with such incredible ability is. And speaking of him, Alan had cast a spell at the exact coordinates where the old man was, so the spell hits the man and opens a rift along the way. After that, a ghastly creature approaches the man calmly. At that moment, Alan arrives to ask some things he needed to know, but it seems someone arrived before him. Then this creature returns to the Count of Westfelt and informs that he eliminated Horace to prevent the information from leaking. According to the Duke, this was the minimum to be done since the blame lies precisely with the demons. His son goes further, saying that the demons put on such a show just to not end up killing the saint or the elf in the end, so it seems they're not as good as they claim. With that, the demon expresses his dissatisfaction, frightening the boy, and he soon states that he will deal with the princess and the elf. The cab announces that he will take care of the archbishop's hero, but his son asks to stay with the archbishop after all, he's not a failure like his brother and can handle this easily. Hey folks, we're kicking off the new anime season, and if you enjoyed this anime and want to see more of it, go ahead and hit that like button down below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We need your support to reach our goal of 70,000 subscribers. Every subscription counts and helps us grow our community. Catch you next time.